From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We want to check with the markets as we do every day. Not a terribly dramatic day, but uh, tech seems to be coming back. And by the way, bonds aren't trading at all, right, Abigail? This is Abigail Doolittle, because we have Veterans Day. Yes, indeed, David. We do have the bond market uh, closed for Veterans Day, and thank you to all who have served. Very much appreciate your service to our country. Uh, relative to the markets, it's fairly quiet. And what makes this unusual, David, is we're not looking Looking at small moves, the S&P 500 up about eight tenths of one percent. The tech-heavy Nasdaq index is up closer uh, to two percent. We do have, though, a little bit of a reversal of the rotation that we've seen this week, and of course, the rotation I'm talking about that you and I talked about yesterday and the day before into value, into small cap. Today, uh, folks really going toward those big tech names. But what really stands out again, David, is it just feels relatively quiet. We don't have any crazy headlines that we're dealing with. It seems as though investors are enjoying this pause for the markets and the bulls overall are taking it even though we do have small declines uh, for both small cap and energy and some of those other cyclical uh, sectors taking a little bit of a break today. Yeah, maybe we've earned just a little bit of calm after all the storm. Thanks so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. Well, the Affordable Care Act really got some attention yesterday, first in the challenge to it in the Supreme Court of the United States and then from President -elect Biden, who reiterated his commitment to improve, not replace, Obamacare. We're going to do everything in our power to ease the burden of health care on you and your families. I promise you that. As I said, I will protect your health care like I protect, like as of my own family. And we've been, unfortunately, significant consumers of health care. That starts by building on the Affordable Care Act with the dramatic expansion of health care coverage and bold steps to lower health care costs. We welcome now one of the architects of the Affordable Care Act. He's Jonathan Gruber. He's the Ford Professor of Economics at MIT and earlier served as technical consultant to the Obama administration, helping to draft the legislation that became the Affordable Care Act. So, Professor, thanks so much for being with us. After that argument in the Supreme Court yesterday, it doesn't look at least like the court's inclined to overturn it altogether. So then we turn back to what should be done to enhance Affordable Care Act, as we just heard from the president-elect. Yeah, I, I agree. The, uh, it was a good day in court yesterday for the, for the ACA. Pretty hard to see after the questions and lack of answers that Brett Kavanaugh asked that he could, he, that he could rule against the ACA. So uh, I think we can hopefully move forward with the assumption the ACA stands, and then the question is where does it need to be fixed? And I think, you know, Joe Biden has laid out a platform with, you know, uh, two sort of key approaches to trying to fix it. Well, really, I'd say three. The first is uh, a number of regulatory steps that he can take to undo the damage that the Trump administration did in really undercutting the fundamental premise of the ACA, which is to provide fairly priced, comprehensive insurance for all Americans. President Trump, to, through a series of actions, allowed scam and skimpy health insurance policies to be sold and really undercut the protections that are provided by the ACA. Joe Biden can, on day one, get rid of those. So that's a good step. The second step is to address the fact that for many Americans getting health insurance on the ACA exchanges, it's just not generous enough. Um, in particular, those who are sort of lower middle income, um, there are people who still can end up paying 15, 20 percent of their income on health care, even if they're on getting subsidies through the ACA exchanges. So Biden's proposed to make those exchanges more generous. Uh, that is, I think, not controversial in terms of, you know, uh, politically controversial, but it does cost money. Uh, and so there we come down to what's going to happen with control of the Senate. And uh, if Democrats don't control the Senate, would some Republicans go along with making the ACA subsidies more generous? So that's the second piece. The third piece is the most ambitious piece, which is both the public option and expanding the age of Medicare to age 60. Both of those are more ambitious in the sense that even 50 votes won't get those done. Uh, in the Senate unless the Democrats with 50 votes got rid of the filibuster. And I, I think those are harder because unlike the, say, expanding the ACA subsidies, which is really just there's only fiscal hawks on the other side, you start to make a lot of enemies with things like the public option. The insurer companies don't like the public option. Doctors get worried they'll be paid less. Um, lowering the age of Medicare to age, to, to age 60, some insurance companies might, be, might worry about its encroachment on private insurance. 
So those start to become larger political battles, not just fiscal battles. So, Professor, that's a terrific uh, three-part analysis. But as I listen to you, it sounds like uh, you're going to need something to happen with the Senate for number two and number three. The only thing that really the president can do on his own is some regulatory changes, including toughening up I guess, some of the standards for the, the policies that are available. Also, I've heard things about enrollment periods and maybe reaching out more. They could do that on their own, but, but the rest of it, he's going to have to get a majority in the Senate. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so, you know, you're right. I, I, I missed that other key part. There are a number of things he can do on his own. So once again, let's remember the key contribution to the Affordable Care Act was making it so when you buy insurance, you know you're getting insurance. Millions of Americans are buying products where they went to the hospital. They found out they weren't actually covered for their hospital bills. Uh, and President Trump allowed those kinds of products to creep back into the market, and Joe Biden will go back to making sure that they are no longer available. He will also, as you say, expand outreach funding and make it uh, provide more emphasis on people to getting insurance coverage. But on the bigger ticket items, let's divide it, but I think it's important to divide number two and three on my list, because I think making these changes more generous could have some bipartisan appeal, even if Democrats don't get the Senate. You could imagine saying, look, here's people buying insurance in the private market. Uh, the subsidies are not generous enough to make it really affordable for them. You could imagine a situation where one or two Republican senators could agree that, hey, this is an issue we need to deal with. Um, it's, it, it's not likely, but it's not impossible. I think it's pretty much impossible to conceive of a world where you get a public option or lowering the Medicare age without Democrats having at least 50 votes in the Senate. Well, well, Professor, it's interesting to me. I wonder how you see it as a student of this, really. We're talking about, I think it's probably going to be too hard to get a public option. Realizing public option was the weaker alternative to Medicare for all. Is one of the outcomes of this election, no matter what else you think, is the public, by and large, has said, we don't want to go too far, too fast toward, toward socialized medicine. Well, you're, you're, you're actually tapping into a constant text debate. I'm having my 26-year-old daughter who would draw the opposite conclusion, who's, who would say that, look, uh, advocates and, you know, progressive advocates who advocated for Medicare for All won their elections, and her conclusion would be no. In fact, there's evidence now we need to move to the left. So I, you know, I, 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 I honestly don't know about that. Uh, what I do know um, is that uh, the public option – remember, there's, is going to public option is really a 3A and a 3B. Is what I call the public option light and the public option heavy. The public option light is to say, look, we're going to have a new alternative on the exchanges. It's not going to have government-regulated rates. It's just going to be a new nonprofit government-sponsored insurance company. And the key that thing that that would accomplish is provide an avenue to enroll individuals in these states that mm -hmm. have not expanded Medicaid. Mm -hmm. It provide an option to get people enrolled in these states like Florida and Texas, which have criminally mm -hmm. left millions of their residents um, uh, left millions of the residents un, uh, uninsured when Medicaid could be available, largely paid for by the federal government. Yeah. So, so, so basically, that is um, that's uh, you, you know that's uh, one thing could do. The public option heavy would yeah. be actually having regulated rates. That's a bigger challenge. But in any event, looks like we better keep our eye on Georgia for things like that. Thank you so much, Professor. Always great to have you with us. That's Jonathan Gruber. He's Ford Professor of Economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Coming up here, energy policy under a Biden administration. We talk with the man who ran it for President Obama. He's Ernest Moniz, former Secretary of Energy. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We've been taking a look at what the next four years may hold under a President Biden. And the president-elect made a series of policy proposals on climate and energy during his campaign, from taking the carbon out of power generation to reducing subsidies on fossil fuels to creating 10 million new clean energy jobs. Welcome now Dr. Ernest Moniz, who left his position as professor of physics at MIT to serve as President Obama's energy secretary. He is now co-chairman of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being back with us. Really appreciate it. And, and, and I think you've suggested maybe we take a look at what uh, is bipartisan and therefore most likely get done as opposed to what the president would have to do on his own and then last what he needs the Congress for. So what about on the bipartisan front in the area of cleaner energy? What do you think might get done? Uh, good to be back first, uh, I, I should say, uh, David. Um, I think there are two major areas uh, where I think there will, be, there will be bipartisan interest in moving the ball forward. Uh, one is uh, the innovation agenda. Uh, the innovation agenda is really core uh, to, uh, 
to really <laughs> ramping up uh, much more uh, than, than we have in terms of addressing uh, clean energy. Uh, and, uh, and the evidence has been there in the last few years, frankly, uh, not in the administration, but in the Congress uh, of uh, pretty good support for uh, increasing the clean energy innovation uh, agenda. The second area I would say is uh, energy infrastructure, probably part of a broader uh, infrastructure initiative. Uh, we all know we desperately need uh, to uh, renew our infrastructure uh, and to build new infrastructure in the energy arena uh, to manage uh, the uh, different, uh, different kinds of technologies that will be in use, much more renewables and, and storage and the like. Uh, and I might add, by the way, from personal experience, uh, there's no question the vice president uh, and president-elect uh, is very interested in, in this. In fact, in 2015, uh, when we released our major study on energy infrastructure, uh, the vice president then, uh, Biden, uh, insisted uh, that he wanted to be part of that release, and we, we did that in Philadelphia. So I think he'll be uh, strongly committed to that. Both of these may end up in a stimulus uh, package or some other kind of, of uh, kind of extra budget uh, activity, but I do believe that there is a very, very strong foundation of bipartisan support in both cases. And the first one, if I could, your old shop, the Department of Energy actually has a fair amount of money each year that they can invest in innovation, as I understand it. It's not clear that under the Trump administration they used it all, but Congress seems pretty open to investing in real R&D and real serious science. Absolutely. The, uh, frankly, in these last several years, the administration budgets that go up to the Hill have typically called for 40 percent reductions and the Congress has said, bipartisan, no thank you, uh, and has actually increased the budgets uh, uh, decently. Uh, as programs like ARPA-E, for example, uh, that got started <laughs> that started in 2009 with the stimulus package back then, when the economy, of course, was uh, was uh, a kind of pretty t pretty tough shape. Uh, and ARPA-E has proved to be uh, very very effective. Uh, in getting new company startups, et cetera, in clean energy. And the Congress, uh, uh, I believe this year, will have their budget uh, rise from the initial $100 million to well over $400 million. So we have innovation, we have infrastructure as bipartisan p potential. Let's talk about what the administration can do on its own. The President of the United States with his energy secretary, what can you do? First of all, regulatory repeal. It appears that some of the regulation, uh, regulatory actions are going to cha be changed. Well, uh, certainly, David, executive action uh, is certainly, I, I would project, uh, uh, going to be an important part of this because also because there's no time to lose. And uh, I should say, uh, number one, of course, will be the, the president-elect has said uh, as a day one action uh, would be rejoining the Paris Accord. Uh, but uh, to, re to really reestablish our leadership, uh, that clearly is going to require us to take care of issues at home. And that's where I think your question comes in. I, I would uh, put these executive actions, uh, uh, this again, I'm speaking for myself here, I, you have to, I have to emphasize, but I would kind of put them in three buckets. One is, uh, I might call it uh, back, back to the future, uh, reestablishing the CAFE standards, uh, and in doing so, reinforcing uh, what states are doing, uh, in this case, California's pr prerogative, but, but in general, st what states and cities are doing uh, will be very different when they are aligned uh, with national uh, uh, administration policy. Uh, another, another would be the, the, the Department of Energy uh, efficiency standards, uh, which in the Obama administration, Obama-Biden administration was huge. Uh, it will save almost 3 billion tons of CO2 and over half a trillion dollars of consumer bills uh, by, by 2030. Those have been pretty much dead in the water. I think that's going to be uh, uh, you know, kickstarted again. Then there's the rollback, um, uh, especially EPA uh, uh, actions that have been taken. Uh, I'd mentioned one very prominently would be uh, the control of methane emissions uh, uh, in the end-to-end. -end, uh, uh, it's in many sectors, uh, uh, certainly in the natural gas sector, uh, it's gotten a lot of attention. So I think we'll see clearly uh, that rollback and the Congress has provided for a new administration, uh, in fact, to uh, alert them to the rollback of various provisions that have been done towards the end of a preceding administration. And finally, I think there's going to be very important areas of advancing um, uh, uh, new, new things in a certain sense. 
in FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, I think we will see uh, much more flexibility given to regions for, for carbon pricing. Uh, we'll see regulatory reform for allowing more renewables and, and storage uh, uh, and for creating uh, high voltage uh, transmission lines. Uh, and then in the financial regulatory agencies, uh, we had the recent uh, CFTC, Commodity Futures Trading Commission report that I think is a harbinger for a requiring uh, much more climate uh, risk management and disclosure uh, from, uh, from, from companies. Uh, that of course aligns with the whole ESG mm-hmm. initiatives uh, that the private banks are also uh, uh, pushing forward uh, aggressively. So I think we'll see quite a bit of change um, without legislative action. Well, and let's go to the legislative action because you've described a fair amount that could be bipartisan, that could be uh, unilateral from the executive branch. But let's be honest, the, the president-elect has set out some very ambitious goals, as I understand, carbon-free in power generation by 2030, uh, carbon-free uh, in the overall economy by 2050. You're not going to get there with that legislation, are you? No, you're you're right. I mean, uh, certainly for um, the big push that we need to make uh, to going to a deeply decarbonized economy uh, by mid-century, there's going to have to be legislation. Uh, The clearly, uh, for the near term, uh, the outcome of the Senate races in Georgia uh, will clearly play an important role um, uh, as to who's in who's in the majority, uh, because we what we. Uh, maybe sometimes forget. Um, I certainly didn't when I was uh, in the uh, in a split government, if you like. Uh, is that the majority, uh, as narrow as it may be, um, has a lot of control over what actually comes to the floor uh, for uh, for for a vote. So, so the, yeah. those Georgia elections are clearly important. Yeah. Uh, if they uh, uh, certainly, right. uh, if both go. Uh, democratic, right. Right. Uh, then we may be seeing things like yep. uh, carbon pricing uh, yep. introduced. Uh, and uh, uh, But whatever the case, <clears throat> as we all know in the Senate, uh, yep. we'll presumably need yep. 60 votes. And so it's about building coalitions. Yep. Uh, and that's yep. something where the vice president uh, and president-elect uh, have made a career of that. Yeah, he's had a lot of experience with that, no question about it. Thank you so much. As I say, always yeah. a delight to have you with us. That's former U.S. Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz. Still ahead, we talk about the Pfizer vaccine candidate with the chief commercial officer of Pfizer's partner, Biontech. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Most of the world woke up Monday morning to the exciting news that the vaccine candidate from Pfizer and BioNTech had shown very promising early results in its phase three trials. Welcome now, BioNTech's chief commercial officer. He is Sean Merritt. So as I say, first of all, congratulations. It looks like you're on the right path. You're not there yet. You're on the right path. But give us some sense, assuming the science holds up, and that's an assumption I understand, including on safety, but let's assume that holds up. What is realistic to expect, Sean, in terms of manufacture and distribution? Yeah, thanks, David. It's, it's great to be on the show. Um, uh, I think that um, the first thing that we should um, uh, remember is that um, what we've been doing since uh, we started the uh, COVID program at the end of January is really concertina what typically takes 12 to 14 years uh, in development into less than a year. And overlaying that, we're using a brand new technology, mRNA, uh, which is part of our vaccine. So what that means is that uh, we're having to build all of the manufacturing and scale it up uh, in real time as we develop the product clinically. Now, we BioNTech has uh, its own manufacturing. It's been manufacturing mRNA since 2011 for its um, oncology clinical trials. But uh, that, of course, is a very different scale sure. than what we're contemplating now. Uh, and um, so I think it's um, uh, what we've said publicly is in 2021, uh, we really plan to deliver 1.3 billion uh, doses. Uh, I think everyone should expect that, that that will, as you would expect, 
not be all there at, on January the 1st, 20, 2021, mm -hmm. but will be spread over the year and we'll be scaling up as we bring more factories well, online to, um, to support that uh, goal. Sean, let me ask you just about that exactly, because as I understand it, there's a 50 million dose commitment to the United States in this calendar year, and then, as you say, 1.3 billion next year. If you were going to guess, and I understand it's just a projection right now, how much of that would come in the first half of the year and how much would be second half of the year? Is it back and loaded, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, well, I, let, let, let me just give you um, some perspective on that. So, so uh, one of the factories that will be coming online next year, uh, in the first quarter of next year, is a facility that uh, we bought uh, in September from uh, Novartis. Uh, and uh, we're just transferring the technology into that facility. So once that gets up and running in steady state, we anticipate that producing about 750 million doses per year but uh, at the beginning of course is going to be uh, is going to be less so I think you can uh, you can you can um, uh, uh, calculate that in the first half of the year or the second half of the year will be more in steady state across our network than in the first half of the year. And, you know, the exact split of that, uh, I think it's, it's, um, it's dependent on so many factors, uh, including, of course, how successful we are at getting all of our factories to work optimally uh, as quickly as possible, which is, of course, the goal. And there's also the there's also the 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 issue of how it's transported because I understand it has to be kept at something like 97, 90 degree, ni minus seventy degrees centigrade as you transport it. Yeah. Does that suggest, as a practical matter, this is going to be feasible for perhaps for developed countries, but the less developed countries, the developing world, is really going to struggle with it? Because I've seen things, for example, out of India, where people are saying, you know, we're not sure we can handle this. Yeah, it's a, it's a really excellent question, and I think that um, you know the first thing uh, that uh, we've been uh, very much focused on is just mm -hmm. getting a safe, effective vaccine uh, to as many people as right. we can as quickly as possible. Right. Um, uh, now, uh, to yep. your to your question. Yep. Uh, of course. Um, just, just of briefly. course. Uh, minus 70 uh, right. uh, storage and uh, distribution in in some of the uh, developing countries. Sean, I'm so sorry. Our computer is about to take us off. I'm going to have to interrupt you, but we really appreciate you being with us. It's Sean Merritt, Biontech's Chief Commercial Officer. And this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. President Trump visited the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington National Cemetery for the annual Veterans Day ceremony. It was his first time appearing in public since his election loss. President Trump has made no public comment since President-elect Biden surpassed the 270 electoral votes on Saturday needed to win the presidency. His legal team has filed a barrage of lawsuits alleging voter fraud in battleground states. The president-elect and his wife Jill Biden marked Veterans Day with a visit to the Korean War Memorial in Philadelphia. Vice President Pence is postponing a trip to Sanibel, Florida, a regular vacation spot for his family, as President Trump continues to fight his election loss. Bloomberg has learned the trip will be delayed until later this fall. Some of Mr. Trump's allies have noted that Mr. Pence has been largely absent from the effort to overturn the results, with the exception of some supportive tweets. Texas has reached the unwanted distinction of being the first U.S. state with more than one million confirmed coronavirus cases. Texas had more than 10,000 new cases in the past 24 hours, a new record. The state recently surpassed California as having the most cases. Nationwide, there have been more than one million new cases of COVID-19 since the beginning of the month. Pope Francis is vowing to rid the Catholic Church of sexual abuse and, quote, eradicate this evil. The statement comes one day after the Vatican's report into the decades-long church cover-up of the misconduct of ex-Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. 
The report put most of the blame on the late Pope John Paul II for ignoring McCarrick's behavior. Francis defrocked McCarrick last year after a separate Vatican investigation found he sexually abused both adults and children. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. And we have some new race projections. The Associated Press now says President Trump has won Alaska's three electoral votes. The AP also says the Republican Senator Dan Sullivan has won a new term. That will bring the Senate total to 50 Republicans, meaning the Democrats have to win both Georgia runoffs in order to take Senate control. In the meantime, let's turn back to the coronavirus and the pandemic. Throughout his campaign, President-elect Biden made fighting this pandemic his first and highest priority, and he addressed it again in his victory speech Saturday evening. Our work begins with getting COVID under control. I will name a group of leading scientists and experts as transition advisors to help take the Biden-Harris COVID plan and convert it into an action blueprint that will start on January the 20th, 2021. I will spare no effort, none, or any commitment to turn around this pandemic. On Monday, President-elect Biden named 13 scientists to his COVID-19 task force, including Dr. Michael Osterholm. He is director of the Center for Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota, and we welcome him now to Bloomberg. So, doctor, thank you so much for being with us. We thank heard the president basically give you your mandate. You're going to take it and make it into an action blueprint. What does that mean in your understanding? How do you take the plan and make it into an action blueprint for the country to make a difference? Well, first of all, uh, let me just say that I'm very honored to be part of this uh, task force and, and to help however we can. And we're clearly in the earliest days of this action. And so uh, we're still as a group working with the transition team and with the president-elect, vice president-elect uh, to determine how to best be most effective. So at this point, uh, it, we, I don't have anything to report, but I'm excited by uh, the opportunity to do this. So give us a sense, doctor, if you can, of where we are and where we're headed. We also heard uh, the president-elect say that we're going to have a, he called it a dark winter. I've heard you in your podcast say you better fasten your seatbelt for this winter. Uh, this disease does not turn around on a dime. It tends to keep going in the same direction until it gets turned. If we don't do anything right now, how bad could it get? Well, just we have to put this uh, number in perspective. Remember that at Labor Day, uh, we were at about 23 to 24,000 cases reported each day. Now we're reporting over 130,000 cases a day, and we're well on our way to well over 200,000 cases a day. Our healthcare system is already overwhelmed in many locations in the country, and that is only going to continue to increase as these new numbers uh, add up. And uh, they, they are, in a sense, you might say, already in the pipeline if we don't have some immediate action for people to distance themselves from sharing air with other people, which I don't see happening. So we're going to have a, a serious crisis, uh, much more than we've had already, just within the next uh, you know, weeks to months. And is it more serious than we've had already, in part because of the overall numbers that you describe, uh, or is it also because it seems to be so widespread? I mean, going back to, to April, uh, here in New York, we had a, a center of it, but a lot of the rest of the country wasn't affected. As I look at maps right now, uh, for example, of positivity, boy, it's up almost across the entire country. You know, this is what we uh, knew would eventually happen. You know, I said back in March that we would not have blue and red states or blue and red counties. We'd have COVID-colored counties by the time this was over with. You know, all we've ever tried to do is minimize the number of new cases and serious illness and deaths until we can get to a vaccine, which is still going to be well into next year. And so for the next uh, two and a half to three months, we're going to basically be seeing just what you said, cases all throughout the entire country, rural, urban, north and south, east and west. And that's the challenge of this pandemic is now that it's hit a level where it is nationwide at the same time. And that means all the resources that we had available to us in the spring wave that you noted in April or the summer wave that we had in July, that we could share healthcare workers in different locations of the country with other locations. Right now, we need everything everywhere. And so that's what's adding, in fact, to the challenge we have in responding to the pandemic. So when you say, doctor, that we may well be headed to 200,000 new cases a day, is that inevitable? Uh, is there something we could do if we did it right now, understanding we're not doing it right now, but if we did, could we blunt that? Could we change that curve? Or are we headed there no matter what? And, and frankly, how much further up could it go? 
Well, at this point, I don't see anything in the short term that's going to change that. If you look at the pandemic fatigue has set in, we're seeing people who are basically going to bars and restaurants, weddings, funerals, having home celebrations, going to gymnasiums. I can go down the list. That's all happening. Then we have that group that I call pandemic anger about a third of the population that still believes that this pandemic is a hoax and that therefore no public health action is really needed. And then you combine that with the increasing uh, occurrence of indoor air exposures, meaning we're going indoors for the winter. And we know that the virus concentrations in rooms are much higher than it is when you're outdoors. You put that all together, that's already baked into what is going to be a severe challenge. Uh, in terms of getting us below 200,000 cases a day, that's not something I see that's gonna happen immediately. Uh, but it will happen if people would just listen to what's happening. They see what's happening. And eventually, I think if enough cases occur in their own home families or their hometowns, they will see that. But that's the heck of a price to pay uh, to get us to that point. The president-elect has been steadfast, at least from what I've seen, in saying you got to wear a mask, you got to socially distance. He's been saying the right things all through the campaign. He's repeating it now as well. He's certainly taking that position uh, with, without a doubt. Should we have any solace at all in the level of lethality? Uh, are we better at treating this disease now so perhaps we won't have the same level of deaths as we did, for example, in the spring? You know, one of the really unsung hero uh, outcomes of this uh, whole entire pandemic has been what the intensive care medicine physicians, nurses, uh, entire response teams have taught us. We are seeing uh, and have seen up till now almost a 60 to 70 percent reduction in the fatalities, the number of people who die who are in intensive care units. And that has not come because of a blockbuster new drug. That's come because of just understanding more about how the virus infects us and what we can do to blunt that impact. The challenge we have now is we're outstripping intensive care medicine capability. And when we have hospitals overrun, literally at that point, you can't get that same quality of care. It's just not possible. In addition, it starts to impact on other conditions such as heart attacks, strokes, et cetera, where the health in the community overall suffers. So the sheer numbers of cases is going to have a big impact and actually uh, the in number of people dying increasing per the number of people who get infected. Uh, doctor, we had this news of the Pfizer-BioNTech candidate in the vaccine, which everybody agreed was good news, not the answer necessarily, but good news for all of us. Uh, how hopeful are you about that, as well as other vaccines and what it indicates about the possibility of others coming along? And is there a sense in which this good news could be bad news in the sense that people will get their hopes up and relax some of the things that you think we should be particularly diligent about right now? Well, you know, I want to uh, be at the out front say I'm encouraged by this information and I think it's helpful, but I think everyone wanted good news so badly that they kind of jumped over some qualifications that need to be understood. Number one is it was 90% effective in, in something. What is that? Was it just preventing cold-like symptoms, fever, cough? Was it 90% effective in reducing hospitalizations, deaths, et cetera? We don't know that yet. That hasn't been reported. It surely would be helpful even if we could reduce minor illness. But what we're really looking at is what will it do for really serious illness? And we know from influenza, for example, the very vaccine responses that we need most in high-risk people for bad outcomes of influenza are where we see the least response. So we still have to better understand what 90% effectiveness means. And then as you've already just detailed with your previous guest, uh, you know, there are challenges to putting a 94 degree, minus 94 degree uh, vaccine out here that has to be refrigerated like that. So there are still challenges, but it's encouraging that at least in this vaccine, we have some positive response, but how much we still don't know. So, so doctor, I understand you've just been convened at the task force. And as we keep saying, there's only one president at a time. Uh, President-elect Biden cannot take office until he takes the oath of office on January 20. Is your goal to have your task force to have, uh, as we say, a turnkey operation on that day, January 20, that we can put into, into implementation? And if so, how quickly could it have some real effects in the world? Well, again, I can't comment on that. The task force leadership will comment on that. Uh, you know, I am obviously very impressed with the commitment that the president-elect and vice president-elect have had for being uh, on the ground running on January 20th for anything that can be done before that time. So uh, how that finally works out will be up to that leadership, but uh, I'm, I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing. 
Okay, well, Doctor, we really appreciate your work on this, and we're all rooting for you. Goodness knows we all have to be, whether we're Republicans or Democrats. Thank you very much to Dr. Michael Osterholm. He is director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. Coming up, the next four years of education under a Biden administration. We talk with former Secretary of Education Margaret Spellings. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. President-elect Biden has laid out ambitious plans for education during his administration, and so our series on the next four years turns to what we can expect for our schools with Margaret Spellings, who served as Secretary of Education under President George W. Bush and then went on to be president of the 17th Institution University of North Carolina System. So, Madam Secretary, thank you so much for being with us. As I read about education right now, the first thing I read and pretty much what everybody says is it's about COVID-19 and how we can safely get our kids back to K to 12 schools. Do you agree with that? I absolutely do. And I think we've seen that, you know, the, the functioning of our schools is central to the recovery of our economy and the functioning of our families and uh, not to mention uh, the education of this next generation of students. So COVID and schools are, you know, top of the pyramid. So what can the federal government, as opposed to state or local government, do on that score? Is it mainly just fight COVID overall, or are there specific things that it can do with respect to our schools? Well, it can do a lot. For starters, uh, we can convene experts that can help us uh, understand what those proper protocols for health and uh, public health and for student safety are. What are best practices? What are we learning from around the country? Uh, secondly, we can help our educators understand how to use space. Uh, you've just rightly said in your previous uh, interview, uh, those students who've been learning uh, online and outside, uh, those things are going to change. Uh, we can understand and help our teachers use technology in, in more uh, fulsome ways and more effective ways. And we can take leadership at the federal level around broadband and device ubiquity. So there's really a lot the federal government can do to respond immediately. How much of it is money? Because I saw that the organization representing superintendents across the school said we need about $200 billion was the number to really help our schools COVID-proof themselves, if that's possible. Well, state and local governments need need resources, and I hope that we'll have that uh, in the next CARES package, either through uh, states or through uh, local school districts. But sure, resources are a part of it, not the only part. What about preschool? I mean, that, the particular focus on preschool, obviously that's terribly important, as you know better than I, in the education process generally, but specifically with child care issues as people try to get back to work. Absolutely. Again, that, that goes to the functioning of our families and our economy. And sadly, we're seeing millions of students across our country who were registered in, in school last spring who didn't show up uh, this year, this school year, and many of them at the early grades. And so we must address those issues. We, go, we need to go find those students. We need to work with those families. And we need to find ways where they can congregate in small groups and pods, the the new uh, term of art, uh, so that so that our, our schools, our kids can learn and our families can function. Would it help public schools to have some more guidance? I mean, I know speaking from experience here in New York, it comes from the governor, not from the federal government, as to when you have to close down, when you ha can stay open, things like that. Should there be federal national guidance on the conditions under which you should be opening school? Well, I think it's a combination. Sure, obviously, solutions have to be customized to the facts on the ground and the prevalence of the disease on the ground. But can we learn from each other? Can we uh, understand what models are working? Can we understand how best to use technology? Can we respond to, uh, to, to finding students? I mean, what are those best practices? How do we aggregate those and share them? I mean, right now, uh, you know, thousands of school districts are inventing this on their own every day. Uh, individual classroom teachers are having to kind of figure it out on their own, and we can we can do better than that. Can we build and improve our overall education system at the same time we're fighting this this COVID nineteen epidemic? I mean, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that George W. Bush, your old boss, really made education a priority. You really implemented the No Child Left Behind program. Did that work? Do we have to set that to one side, or can we actually, in this crisis, still pursue a fundamental underlying buttressing of our education system? 
We we absolutely must because COVID has revealed the systemic you know, inequities in our system that No Child Left Behind attempted to address through investments in reading, through, uh, you know, holding ourselves as adults accountable for the achievement of all students. And, you know, it, it, uh, it really bugs me when I hear people say we need to go back to normal. No, we don't, because normal had, you know, millions of students left behind, if you will, uh, and we have to, you know, reinvent this model to be more responsive to all students. So and we can Sorry. Madam Secretary, you and I have been talking thus far about preschool and K through 12. Let's spend a minute on higher education because that was actually something raised during the campaign. Questions like free tuition and forgiveness of student loans. What do you think is a sensible policy over the next four years with respect to higher education? You know, I think things that will address the immediate needs in the aftermath of COVID around uh, displaced workers, around job training, around getting resources uh, to those individuals, but also alignment between what we in colleges and universities produce and, and the demands of the marketplace today. And so we have a lot of retooling to do. I'm in Texas, uh, an oil and gas industry that is uh, you know, likely to shrink over time in some ways. How do we engage that workforce, retool, retrain, uh, so that those individuals can participate in advanced man manufacturing and, and other uh, fields? You, you talk about the oil and gas industry having to retool and perhaps get smaller. What about higher education? Are we going to see some shakeout, some some, some consolidation? Because a lot of those institutions of higher learning, as you know so well, are under enormous financial pressure right now. Absolutely. And we're going to see, you know, I think people are, are wrong when they talk about kind of higher education as one monolithic type enterprise. We have just a wide variety from gigantic little cities in our flagship universities to, you know, very customized learning at smaller liberal arts colleges or HBCUs or uh, MSIs, uh, et cetera. And so, yes, they're all under strain. They're all under financial challenge. And we need to reinvent a lot of our models. Uh, we can't be, uh, you know, all things everywhere. And so how do we set our priorities and align our resources around that? Because we know one thing for sure, more people will need education and training. What we offer in American higher education in more affordable, more convenient, right. and more relevant ways. And it's a great opportunity to reinvent our institutions to respond. Okay, and finally, and just briefly we could, Madam Secretary, just in case the president-elect is listening, what advice do you have on a secretary of education? I'm not asking for a name, but what sort of person? Does it have to be an educator? You know, I, I would look for a, a governor, at someone who's led at an executive level, somebody who understands the role of the federal government versus the, the primary share of funding and, and policymaking that comes at the state and local level. Uh, you know, we know we're most effective when, you know, top uh, right. down, it's bottom up. Right. So somebody who can develop those right. relationships, somebody right. who has the ear of the president and somebody who understands, uh, you know, the centrality yeah. of education to the prosperity of our country. Fascinating suggestion. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure having you with us. That's former Education Secretary Margaret Spellings. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Our colleague Jason Kelly recently talked with Mayor Muriel Bowser of Washington, D.C. at the third annual Summit on Security presented by the National 9-11 Memorial and Museum. They started by talking about racial justice and inequality. Uh, let me let me be clear, Jason. Our country has an experience with inequality, um, and I think part of the racial reckoning that we're experiencing um, across uh, our entire country is dealing with those systemic issues that are bigger bigger than a local government response, um, and they they are going to be bigger than 2020. Uh, you don't erase um, all of the things that have kept uh, certain groups in our country, African Americans specifically, from gaining wealth, from having a, a fair shot in education and job opportunities, um, from, uh, you know, making sure that we're scrubbing our criminal justice system so that it is fair and non-discriminatory. Um, so those things, um, when, we, when we're doing that together as a nation, uh, and we have that leadership at the top, and we have and people in all levels of government working towards those ideals, 
the ideals are, are important, um, but the practice and the, the policies are even more important. So we're focused on that. Uh, in our city, uh, we are, uh, like Mayor Bottoms has mentioned, uh, we've uh, crafted our entire reopen plan around equity. Not everything that we've learned from COVID is bad um, about how to reorder government. Uh, we know that we have even used our emergency um, programs uh, to have more equitable outcomes for businesses and people. Um, so part of our reopen plan um, looks to equity as one of its key pillars. From a personal perspective, how do you look back on these last seven and eight months and how has it affected you? I'm grateful and then this may sound odd that I have the opportunity to lead now. Um, because I see this as one of the toughest times in my city. I know that I'm going to use the best information and make the best decisions for the most people, as I have done um, every, every year I've been in office. But I, I feel personally um, confident uh, in the people I have around me and in my residents and how we will move forward. Washington Mayor Muro Bowser, and this is Bloomberg.